Good morning. Welcome to King's this morning, or King's Church, Frodham. This morning you'll notice a slight difference in the um, South African accent. So uh, as you're aware, Scott is away in South Africa at the moment, so we will lift him up in our prayers this morning. But um, you're stuck with myself trying to uh, tie together what, be, what we're doing, a bit like pre, uh, pre-Scott. <clears throat> um, and this morning, we're really excited. Steve is going to be bringing God's Word, so we'll lift him up too in our prayers. So let's... Um, I'll do a few announcements, I guess, first things first. This, I know that I've been mentioned to me this morning. Um, tonight is the Bible study online, so that will still be going on, this, uh, even though Scott is away. So that is happening. And um, I'm just going to open the floor. Is, is there anything else I should be mentioning that is on or isn't on <laughs> in church this week? <laughs> nope? Very good. Well, let's stand. Let's pray. Let's uh, open our service. And um, we've got a, <clears throat> a really good God who's he's just, he's in our midst, he's with us, and we want to declare to him this morning just how brilliant he is, how amazing he is, and we're going to lift our voices to him. Father God, we thank you for bringing us safely to this place. We thank you for the community that you've put together here at King's Church from all around, Lord, and we, we're, we're just truly here because we want to be in the place where you are, to hear your hear your word and to, to, to sing our praises to you and communally, Lord God, to, to lift you up and to, to just declare how good you are, how amazing you are, and what you've done for us is awesome. We thank you for, for that. And this morning we lift up, lift up Scott on his travels. We pray that everything's going well, as well as can be, and that all of the, uh, the traveling just goes smoothly. Sometimes it can be a bit of a, an awkward thing when things just go wrong. So, we pray your blessing and hand on his travels, and we pray for Scott's family here, that um, everything goes well here. We, Lord, we also want to pray just for your, co- your congregation at Frodham here. We all love you so dearly, Lord, and we want you to come and open our hearts, open our minds, and be with us this morning. Send your Holy Spirit down on this place right now. Amen, amen. Let's sing. <clears throat> Let's put the cap on. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the On wings like eagles. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. Our God, you reign forever. Bro. 
Lord, we lift you up this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. saved he's given us that eternal life that we can we can hang our hat on and we just know that we know that we know 
that we will live forever with him as long as we have Christ in us. Amen, amen. Let's uh, welcome Steve up. Amen. So I guess the, the first thing I need to check, is the microphone working? No. no? Let's wait for it to go. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. I've done my bit, you see. Um, it, always, it always makes me think of that lovely story of the Anglican vicar who stood up in front of the congregation and said, I think there's a problem with the microphone, to which the congregation replied, and also with you. <laughs> um, so, for those of you who don't know, I'm Stephen Sutcliffe. I'm, uh, I, I've been coming to King's for the last six months. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about uh, where I've come from, I grew up um, in a little sort of Lancashire mill town, reasonably close to Manchester, but for more than 30 years I've lived in Liverpool. And for most of that time I worshipped in a Methodist church across the water in uh, Allerton in Liverpool. Um, and uh, yeah, for 30 years, almost to the month, uh, I was a local preacher in the Methodist uh, church. Six months ago, I felt God calling me elsewhere. And six months ago, I arrived here at King's and I felt welcomed and blessed. And uh, it's my pleasure and joy to be uh, a partner here at King. So those of you who are here today and there's some faces I've not seen before, it's lovely to see you here. For those of you at home, uh, it's great that you're joining us in worship from home, uh, but it's so much better if you can make it here, if you get the chance, come and join your family here at King's in worshipping our God together. So for six months I've been worshipping, this is the first time I've been let loose <laughs> here at King's. And we're in the process of looking at a series of questions that were asked of Jesus. Um, today's question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, uh, I got a little text message from Scott yesterday saying he was thinking about me and praying for me today, so I'm very grateful to that. I did reply saying that, um, that I did feel there was a little pressure on me this week. I don't know if any of you have seen his daily blogs, his Bible coaching series. Um, this week he... he, he he included one which was about the 13-word sermon and about how he encourages people to be brief, <laughs> um, which was a, a little bit uh, intimidating, I've got to say. He then went on to talk about Jesus preaching in Capernaum and being confronted by a man with an evil spirit. So I'm not quite sure what Scott's expectations for this morning are. Um, but whatever you do on the way out, don't tell me it was a nice sermon. <laughs> So what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, we're going to read about this later on, the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler who came and asked that question of Jesus, and after he'd had that dialogue with him, walked away saddened. Have you ever wondered why some people walk away? I mean, I stand here as someone who's absolutely convinced about the truth, the reliability the, the, the reality of what Jesus has said and done. Why is it that some people don't see what I can see, what many of you have found to be true for yourselves? Why do they walk away? I'm reassured that if people walked away when they met with Jesus, then it's perhaps not my fault if other people walk away. I've got a spoiler for you, okay? Okay. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, it's the easiest thing to do, and yet it's the hardest thing to do. Not quite a 13-word sermon, 14 words actually, but it's the closest I could get for this morning. And it's because it's the easiest thing, but still the hardest thing to do, I think that's why some people embrace what Jesus offers, whilst others walk away sadly. And Jesus spoke a little bit about this in his parable of the, the sower. And one of the things he, he said to his disciples was that some people having ears to hear, they hear not. Having eyes to see, they don't see. Some people are skeptics 
and cynical about God and faith. They say science has proved there is no need for God. And nobody has proven the existence of God. And that miracles don't happen. They think that evolution and the Big Bang is an explanation for why we are here. But I'm not so sure. My experience is different from that. Whilst I believe myself to be a person who follows science, not everything I do in life is scientifically proven. I cannot prove that my mum loves me. But I've got a shed load, shed load of evidence that she did. So on the balance of the evidence, I can conclude that my mum loves me. I've never seen something come from nothing. But if there is no God, as far as we know scientifically at the moment, that is the only explanation out there. There is a beginning to the universe. If there's a beginning to time, matter and energy, how did it begin? People say evolution uh, explains everything. I can see evolution as a process, but I can't see it as a cause. How do you get life from non-life? In fact, if you want to live by proof, then the, perhaps the only thing you can be is a mathematician. Because in maths is where you get proof. Two plus two equals four. And it will equal four whether we exist or we don't. And the truth of the matter is one plus two doesn't equal four. Neither does two plus three equal four. It's an absolute truth. So if you want proof, you find it in maths. The problem is that the Bible isn't a scientific textbook. There's no physics. There's no chemistry. And even though we've got a book of numbers, there isn't much maths either. Okay, so there are other forms of evidence that we have to use. How do you prove love? How do you prove that you've got a mind and a conscience? How do you prove that you've got free will? Everybody has a worldview. Everyone makes truth statements. And that includes the Christian, the Buddhist... The Hindu, the Sikh, the agnostic, the atheist. We all make life and truth claims. What I want to say to you today is, don't believe just because somebody else believes. What you should do, if you've got any integrity, is examine the evidence. And then make a decision based upon how true that evidence is. You would be foolish to believe in somebody else's belief without examining the evidence. Faith should not be blind faith. This morning, um, I, I travelled over from Liverpool and I crossed the Runcorn Bridge. Now, I cannot prove to you that the Runcorn Bridge was perfectly designed and that it was built to a high standard such that it will stand. But I've got plenty of evidence of lots of vehicles and lots of pedestrians and lots of um, bikes going across the Runcorn Bridge such that I, based on the evidence, can say on more than the balance of probability, it'll take the weight of me and my bike. Yeah? We, we live our lives based on evidence. Types of evidence. Well, there's scientific evidence. I can take A plus B and I can make C. And then I can try and work out the theory of how that happens. And A plus B becoming C should work, whether it's in Runcorn, Helsby, Frodsham, Manchester, Liverpool, Abu Dhabi, wherever it is, because the evidence of science is reproducible. And then we make theories based upon that, and you can make predictions based upon those theories. But it's interesting, isn't it? The scientist still makes faith claims. So we have a wonderful understanding of, of the cosmos. And yet, when they sit down and calculate what's out there, we can only measure 5% of what needs to be there for the science to work. 95% of what's out there, they call dark energy and dark matter. And they, it's dark because they can't find it. 
but it must be there for the world to exist as it is. So they have faith, and then they seek for the evidence to support that belief. And that's what's happening now. Um, I've got two sons. I've got two sons. And I was, I was, going, to, I was going to use them as a sermon illustration, because I thought they wouldn't be here today. Um, one of them is. I'm still going to use him as a sermon illustration, okay? I've got two sons. They've both been brought up in the same household with the same parents, in the same environment, going to the same church, the same Sunday school, um, exposed to the same schooling and the same education. I've got one who's here to worship God today, and I've got one, well, he's been working all night, so, so we'll give him an excuse, but I don't think he would choose to come. He's sceptical. Why? Is there that difference? We'll do a little, little experiment, I think. Remember what I said about Jesus. Some people have ears to hear but don't hear. Some people have eyes to see but don't see. I've got an interesting clip for you to watch. Ba, ba, ba. Have a look at this. What do you hear? Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. But look what happens when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. And yet, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing ba with a B. Ba, ba. It's an illusion known as the McGurk effect. Take another look. Concentrate first on the right of the screen. Now to the left of the screen. The illusion occurs because what you are seeing clashes with what you are hearing. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. Ba, ba, ba. It's a bizarre ba, effect. Ba, Remember, the only ba, sound you're hearing is ba, ba with a B. Ba, 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 ba. What's remarkable about this illusion is even knowing how it's done doesn't seem to make a difference. The effect works no matter how much you know about the effect. I've been studying the McGurk effect for 25 years now, and I've been the face in the stimuli. I've seen stimuli thousands and thousands of times, but the effect still works on me. I can't help it. The speech brain just takes in that information and doesn't care about what outside knowledge you bring to bear. Ba, ba. Ba, ba, the McGurk ba, effect shows us ba, that what we hear may not ba, always be the truth. Ba, 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 ba. The McGurk effect. Interesting, isn't it? And even though you know what's going on, you can't change how your mind interprets what you're seeing. One of my sons would say, there's no proof of the existence of God. I just wonder sometimes um, whether there are things whispering in the ears of people, persuading them of another reality that leads them astray. We can be easily fooled. We've all uh, seen optical illusions. But other things can get in the way as well. We can be busy. We can be preoccupied. We can be distracted. Let's watch... Another little experiment and see how you get on with this. Shows just how much our brains can miss if they get distracted by too much information. Watch carefully. So this is an experiment, it's a battle of the sexes, men against women, there'll be a difference, but I'm not going to say which way round it's going to be. And it's just a simple observation test. All you need to do is you'll see there are three guys in yellow here, 
and they have a basketball. And it's your job to count the number of times they throw the basketball to each other. Now, to make things slightly harder, uh, there's also three guys in blue track suits. But you ignore them, ignore their basketball, and just concentrate on this one. So uh, if we can run the tape, okay, so that's number one. Okay, if we can stop the tape there for the moment. Okay, okay, be honest here. Anybody notice anything a little bit unusual? Be honest. Okay, it's just about four or five of you. Excellent. The rest of you not notice anything strange, honest? Okay. Right, for you guys, enjoy this moment. Uh, when the first time I saw this, it completely threw me. Now I want you to watch the tape again, but this time just watch it as you would a normal piece of television. No counting the basketball, anything like that. If we can have the, uh, the tape. He's going to make his entrance this time. Here he comes. <laughs> 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 that didn't happen. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. I'm absolutely shocked. I thought I'd spot a monkey walking across the middle of the screen. If you were fooled, it's because your brain was distracted by counting and your eyes weren't expecting the gorilla. Did anybody spot the gorilla? No? Isn't it interesting? Those who say seeing is believing might not be a, a entirely truthful because we can miss what is in plain sight because we're preoccupied, because we're distracted, because we're looking for something different. Our focus is elsewhere. Jesus spoke in parables, so I've got a parable for you just to conclude this opening uh, little section. The kingdom of heaven is a bit like a cook who took an egg and a potato. He boiled them both. One went soft and the other went hard. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Those who have eyes to see, let them see. Very interesting. I didn't see the gorilla. <laughs> Would you like to stand? Okay. <laughs> From the front. <laughs> From the front. <laughs> exactly. You're preoccupied. Makes you think. <laughs> Knowing you, all I once held dear. Just to respond to that before we uh, carry on with episode two. <laughs> I could. 
So, Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. If you want to follow it in a Bible, if you've got a tablet or whatever, by all means, the words hopefully will appear behind me as well. And hopefully I'll be able to read them, although I have to take my glasses off these days to be able to read my Bible. But here we go. This is um, the encounter between Jesus and the rich ruler. Beginning at verse 18 of Luke 18. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honour your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he answered. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this, uh, this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all uh, to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I want us to think of three things and typical of a a, a sermon, it has to have three points and they all have to begin with the same letter. So the three things we have to think about this morning are the person, the purpose 
and the problem, okay? Let's start with the person. This fella comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, being a good teacher, doesn't just give him the answer. Jesus does this all the time, doesn't he? Somebody asks a question and he answers it, often with a different question himself, or with, a different, with an answer to a different question. So on this occasion, like a teacher, he tries to draw out of this young man the answer himself. And he says to him, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. Why would Jesus say that? Well, he's saying that because he wants the man to recognise who he is. He's asking him, who do you think I am? You've called me good. No one is good by, but God. What does logic say then? I am. If I'm good, I must be God. The first thing you've got to do is recognise who this person is. Jesus of Nazareth. Why do you call me good? Who am I? Now, in my experience, most people who claim to be God, I don't get down and worship them. In fact, most of the people I've heard claim to be God have been introduced to colleagues in psychiatric services <laughs> and often need help from the health service. So, the question we've got to ask, Jesus here is claiming to be God. Is he telling the truth? Or is he telling a lie? What is the evidence that what Jesus is claiming is true? How do you find that evidence out? Well, I would suggest you start by looking at the character of the man. Look at his life. A perfect life. That when he was put on trial, they could find no fault with him. Look at his teaching. The most wondrous, ethical, loving, gracious teaching that has ever been heard. Look at his death on the cross. A punishment that was undeserved, unmerited. If that had been me, I would have gone to my grave cursing those who put me there. But no. This Jesus, as he's nailed to the cross, prays, Father Forgive them. And finally, look, that three days later, he rose from the dead. Now, I'm hoping there's nobody died here this morning just yet. But if any of you do die and rise from the dead, I promise I will take what you have to say very seriously. Jesus claims to be God. He claims to have risen from the dead. Is the evidence supporting those claims? Or is he misleading people? How do you find out? Well, I would direct you to these four chapters that begin the New Testament, the Gospels. The Gospels, I believe, are historical documents, well attested with more evidence for them than many other historical events that we believe to be true. There are thousands of Greek um, uh, writings, texts, well attested, consistent, that tell us that what we have here translated is accurate and reliable. So you can look at these like a history book. In fact, if you go to the beginning of Luke's Gospel, that's exactly what he says he's doing. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the very first were eyewitnesses. One form of evidence. An eyewitness is a good, good um, source of evidence. We use it all the time in courts, don't we? So these are eyewitness accounts of what happened. Um, eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. 
Luke has written this gospel for us so we can see the evidence presented. We can examine it and see if it holds true. And if it holds true, we can then make decisions based upon the evidence. Similarly, in John's gospel, um, we, we read this. Jesus performed many other signs, John chapter 20, uh, in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I've put these in this book so you can see the evidence for yourself and draw conclusions from that evidence that Jesus is truly the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Who is this person who claims to be good, who claims to be God, who lived a, a, a perfect life, who taught the most brilliant ethics, who died an undeserved death and who rose again. Is he God? Does the evidence back it up? John in his opening chapter says this, No one has ever seen God, but the, but the, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. When you see Jesus... You see God in human form. That is the evidence that is presented in the Gospels. So, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, the first thing you've got to ask yourself is, who is Jesus? What is the evidence that what he said and did is true? Second thing you have to think about is what is the purpose? What is the purpose of your life? Why did you get up this morning? Why do you wake up every day? Why do you go to work? Why do you do the things that you do? What is the reason for your existence, your life? Why are you here? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus pointed this young man to the commandments, didn't he? Did you notice anything interesting about the commandments that he pointed out? How many commandments are there? Ten. Ten. How many does Jesus say to the young man, keep these commandments? How many are there? It's five. It's five. He tells him, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honour your father and mother. What was the other one? Somebody, oh, what was the other one, the last one? Uh, bum, 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 bum. Do not murder. Ha! Yeah, do not murder. <laughs> good, good job I didn't miss that one. Hand. Yeah, okay. And the rich young man says, but I've done all of that. I've lived to that ethic. Now, the first thing I do is I go back to Jesus' first question to him. What, does, what was the question? Why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. Here is the young man saying, actually, I'm good. So I deserve eternal life. But clearly he doesn't, because what's missing? There are five more commandments, aren't they? Which ones are missing? Those are all about his relationship with other people. And this is a rich young man who has a status in society, who's probably held up as an example. But what is missing? Well, what's the first commandment? Hear, O Israel, I am, the, I am the Lord your God. Before me you shall have no other. Do not have any graven images. Don't worship anything else but me. Yeah? Don't take my name in vain. Yeah? Is that right? Um... Keep the Sabbath day holy. In other words, set aside time to worship me. And the last one that's missing, do not covet. Why did this young man go away? He went away sad. Because what was most important to him? His status, his wealth, his position. His, 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 he was encumbered with all of this baggage. He coveted. And in coveting, he put that before Jesus God in human form in front of him. And what he's forgetting, the one thing he still lacks, is that 
great command to worship and love God. You see, Jesus sums up these commandments in two, two sections, doesn't he? He says the first commandment, the greatest commandment, is love God. And the second is similar. Love your neighbour. And you don't get anything for 50%, which is all this man claimed he had done. What is the purpose and meaning of your life? Why do you get up each day? Why are you living each day? The world says it's all about me. It's all about the self. It's my view, my values. I determine what's right and wrong. I, I, I pursue my desires and my interests. It's my career, it's my feelings, it's my bank balance. It's all about self-esteem and self-worth and self-fulfillment. And what we get is a fragmentation of relationships, broken relationships, because it's all about me. And what we get is a broken society. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, no, love God. And then he says, love neighbour. Now, where is me in that? Where is self in that? It's nowhere to be found. He goes on and he says to his followers, love one another. Now, I look around and I think I've got a fair chance that I might love some of you. Okay, that's easy. I think I can do that bit. But he goes on again and he says more than that. He says, love your enemies. Oh, my goodness. Love... It doesn't mean ignore them, pretend they don't exist. He doesn't mean tolerate them. He doesn't mean um, it, just be ambivalent about them. He, he says be proactive and go and love, love them. As Paul put it, overcome evil with good. Where's the me? Where's the self in that? It's not there. What is the purpose of life. If it is that world view, if what you've got whispering in your ear and distracting you is the world's opinion on life and relationships and value and all those things, then it's all vanity and a chasing after wind because we're just a chemical accident. We're just a primordial soup that's evolved to a higher order and all my thoughts and words are just um, electrical impulses and chemical reactions that happen by chance. It's all vanity and a chasing after wind. And if all I do is seek fame and fortune and look after my family, then in one sense I'm coveting. And everything is relative if it's all about me. There is no uh, concrete basis, foundation to build your life on. But Jesus says there is a purpose. There is a truth that is external to us. There is an objective morality. There is an objective reality. The Bible promises three score years and ten, doesn't it? If there is no God, that's all we've got. And some of us are getting close to our warranty expiring. Some of us might have already gone beyond it. <laughs> And if all we've got is the world's view on things, well, then we haven't got an answer uh, for suffering, for injustice. What we've got is unhappiness. What we've got is soaring levels of mental health uh, problems. What we've got is a confusion of understanding of mor morality. What we've got is a society in this country that doesn't bat an eyelid that over 200,000 unborn individuals are killed every year, legally and lawfully. We live in a society where they're campaign, campaigning that doctors should assist people to kill themselves. What does that say about the value we place on human life? What does it say about the worth we give to one another? What does it say about people who Christians believe are created in the image of, of God? You see, Jesus offers life. He offers life in abundance. And he offers life for eternity. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, firstly, 
I must recognise and understand who this person is. And then I must seek out what the purpose of life is for. Why am I here? If I've done all of that, I've got a chance. So finally, what is the problem? Well, we read, didn't we? When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there have been many explanations trying to identify what the eye of a needle is. I just think it was a needle with an eye, and then you've got this big camel that won't fit through. I have enough trouble getting a cotton thread through the eye of a needle. Um, the, The camel ain't going, as far as I can see. And Jesus says the rich will find it hard to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I I put it to you, I I don't know what's in your bank accounts, but I believe that relative to many, we are rich. We are blessed, we have much. The problem is that the price of following Jesus is to give up everything. Jesus said this, didn't he? If anyone would follow after me, Let him deny himself or herself, take up their cross and follow me. The price is everything. Now, it's very easy to give up everything if you've got nothing in the first place. That's the easiest thing in the world. But if you're rich, that's a heavy price to pay. But that is what Jesus asks. Give up everything for me who gave everything for you. Paul said this, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith In Jesus Christ. Paul gave up everything. The disciples gave up everything. And Jesus goes on to say that the reward isn't just pie in the sky when we die. It's not just for the future. But the reward is now because anyone who gives up family, uh, job, security for me will be rewarded. Because our fulfillment comes not in what we achieve... Our fulfilment is in our relationship with God and what he has done for us. So in summary, nice words to hear. Probably another 25 minutes to go. Um, But in summary, what must I do to inherit eternal life? First of all, I put it to you, you need to look at Jesus and decide who he truly is, the person. You need to then think, is there a purpose and a meaning to life and existence? And what is that purpose? And then, having looked at the evidence, make a choice based upon the evidence. Now, I would ask one other thing. If you're going to be like the rich young man who walks away and decides that the evidence is lacking, that's fine. If you find there is not enough evidence to believe in Jesus, I can accept that. If you tell me that the choice you've made instead has got more evidence to support that as a life choice, as a truth statement, and in a way of being. See, most people don't do that. Most people's objections to Jesus are not because they found something that has more evidence to support it, but they walk away for the same reason that the burglar doesn't find a policeman. It's because they're going in the other direction. People want to go in the other direction because they want to be in charge, make decisions for themselves, decide how their life should be. They want to be in control of everything for themselves. The problem, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Well, in order to inherit something, 
Somebody has to die. You can't inherit. If you do something in order to inherit, you might find you are being visited by the police. And you might find you've got a day in court to answer. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's not about what I can do. The inheritance is given when someone dies. Jesus died. More than that, he rose three days later. There is another way you can inherit. I often say, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a GP. Okay? I often say to patients, the most important thing you ever do in life is choose the right parents. Because you inherit so much from them, you are genetically endowed. What must I do to inherit? Well, you don't have to do anything because someone has died and also because you are made in the image of your Father God. Your value, your worth comes because you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you. Your value is in the creative and loving and caring and compassionate way you can live your life. All that is necessary for you to inherit eternal life has been done. So why don't people flock for this life? This abundant life, this eternal life. Well, I think there's some whispering in the ears that is distorting the message. And there are some eyes that are blinded by the busyness and the distraction of what's going on. So having ears to hear and eyes to see, they hear not and they see not. And for some, it's because it's the hardest thing in the world to do because you've got to give everything up. But the joy is this. It is also the easiest thing to do. Because all you have to do is open your ears to hear the invitation from God. Open your eyes to see the man, the Jesus, the God in human form, and see what he has done for you. And open your heart to receive the inheritance that he has promised to all who will follow him. There's a, an old hymn. It says this. And this is for those of you who've yet to decide who this man is. And it goes like this. It says, now is the time. No more delay. Now is the Lord's accepted day. Come in this moment at his call and live for him who died for all. If you want to give your life in the service of this king, this Jesus, this God in human form, just open up your heart and invite him in. But know that it will cost you everything. But the reward is forever and is more than you can imagine. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for the wonderful gift of life that can be found in Jesus alone. That purpose for life that finds its fulfilment in you. And Lord, I pray that your spirit will now fall upon us, move amongst us, be within us, to lead us closer to you, that we might truly see you in all your glory, that we might understand more of who you are, that we might be willing to go in your name and make disciples and to love, and to love, and to love again our God, our neighbours, our friends, and our enemies, that your name may be proclaimed as the one who loves, who gave his all for us. And for any who are hearing uh, these words for the first time, who want to invite you in, then just say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my selfishness. I am sorry for ignoring you. Forgive me. Come into my life. Change me and make me yours. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Um, the band are going to sing for us now. I'm going to join them briefly, and then uh, I'll, I'll head over to the back there. If anybody wants to talk or pray, uh, then I'll be there. I'm sure there'll be others if, if you'd prefer to speak or pray with someone else. But we'll do it over in the comfy chairs at the back. Is that all right, Tabitha, if we, we take that area? Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. God bless you all. Oh 
Point our eyes and our hearts to you, Lord Jesus. And declare, you are, you are enough, Lord. You are everything to us. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you and to put, a, put the things of this world to the side. Come now, Lord Jesus, and help me do that. That could ever satisfy Through every trial My soul will sing No turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is Enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need Christ my all in all My joy and my salvation And this hope will never fail heaven is our home through every storm my soul will sing jesus is here to god be the glory christ is enough for me everything we need and father we stand here in your presence knowing knowing that you made us knowing that you've got our future in your hands and lord god as we go out this week pray that you be with us let us remember that we need to die to ourselves to to live in the fullness of your kingdom 
be with us now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Please join us for a cup of tea and coffee and some fellowship after. And if you do need any prayer, just um, head to that back corner. We'd love to pray with you. Amen.